We're relying more and more on free online platforms to mediate and inform our lives, but are they really free? As our digital selves are crunched, categorized, and traded, for-profit companies like Facebook, Google, and Amazon make out, exerting an alarming amount of control over our economy and us in the process. It could get much worse, but there are alternatives. This week on the show, I talk with coders, activists, and tech entrepreneurs who are at the forefront of the platform cooperativism movement. They'll share their experience with cooperatively owned and operated digital platforms which distribute rather than concentrate power and wealth. If we take the cooperative route, they argue, tomorrow's digital economy could shrink inequality rather than exacerbate it and change our lives in the digital world and also on the dance floor. Still coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Welcome all to the show. Glad to have you. Let's start with platform cooperativism, because I still don't think people quite understand what we're talking about. So what is a digital platform and why does it need to be cooperativized? <laughs> yes, a uh, digital platform is uh, the type of tool we use every day. As you said, a Facebook is a digital platform. Amazon is a digital platform for buying things. Um, we believe in platform cooperativism that people need to own the platforms that we use daily and engage in. Um, we need to be the keepers of our own information and to put forward the goals we want with our platforms. We are now being owned by platforms that we are on and we are so far engaged in them that they own all of our contacts, all of our information. If you were to be shut off of a platform, you would not have any connection with all the people, the thousands of friends that have given you likes and that you know. Mm. So for platform cooperativism, people need to build and own the platforms that we use. So is it as simple, Stacco, as to say maybe once upon a time the marketplace was where we did our business, now it's some platform online and there's a problem? Well, they increasingly mediate our daily lives. They mediate our elections, how we relate to each other, and we have no ownership of this. And they're actually headquartered in the U.S., but they have worldwide reach. So how about we lower the transactional cost of that collaboration and take ownership of uh, the decision-making of how they affect us? Well, what's the cost we're paying now? The cost we're paying now is that a digital facsimile of you is creating information for advertisers to exacerbate consumerism to give data to further certain political ends, which may not be in accord to you, the data generator. So that reminds me of what we've heard about recently. And we saw some of the leaked memos from um, Mark Zuckerberg and the first Facebook corporation literally bargaining with clients based on the currency they had, which is us. I mean, there's the saying that goes, uh, if it's free, you are the product, right? And I think that's, that's true for all the digital platforms where your data is being sold and your privacy rights are just being used. And just to put a little bit more of a fine pin on it, how is that different from advertising? Because I always say the for money media is all about delivering people to advertisers, unlike the independent media, which is about delivering people to each other. So is it really different? I think it's entirely different. Because advertising is, you know, is a way of sending out a message to the world and you can still decide for yourself whether you want to receive it or not. But uh, what we're talking about here is um, media corporations owning the infrastructure of our society, not only our data, but also, you know, looking at um, Airbnb, for instance, owning streets, owning neighborhoods and uh, transforming the way we live and relate to each other. And I think that's, that's really, that's a different story. So what do we do about this? Stacco, you have this extraordinary disco manifesto that you're releasing and you're kind of on book tour with it now. Mm. Um, it is sort of about disco, but not quite. So what is DISCO? DISCO stands for Distributed Cooperative Organizations. And they're a way for people to get together and work and create and distribute value in commons-oriented feminist economics and peer-to-peer -peer ways. 
you don't get to do this at work very much, you know, to exercise this kind of like right, relationships. And they're also a critique of this kind of monster called the Decentralized Autonomous Organization or DAO. They're basically corporations or organizations that exist on the blockchain that can execute um, contracts, they can levy penalties, they can employ people. So the computer organizations that wield their own economic power. And because technology is far from neutral and it always follows the ideals of those who are investing in it, we're quite concerned about the deployment of these decentralized autonomous organizations. So we came up with the DISCO as an alternative, which is cooperative and solidarity based. This came out of the lift experience of our, of our cooperative called the Guerrilla Media Collective, which started with a project based around translation and combining pro bono work and paid work. So we would do social and environmentally um, aware translations for someone like Ella, for example. But then we would also do client work and the uh, income that would come from our agency work would come back to compensate for the pro bono work. And we did this because volunteering, doing pro bono stuff is cool if you have the privilege to do it. But if you're a mother and you have five kids and you need to get to the end of the month, maybe you want to look into compensatory mechanisms so you can do valuable work. <coughs> so this was the guerrilla translation, guerrilla media collective story. But as we became, through our work in the P2P Foundation, aware of this world of the blockchain, etc., we said, well, we need a feminist reaction to this. And why we need that is it's a movement that talks a lot about decentralization but it doesn't really talk about decentralizing power mm. and this trifecta of hierarchy, which is capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. So how can we operate in the marketplace while articulating those values? Mickey, you've worked closely with the Ujima project in, in, yes. in Boston, where you're based, that is also trying to address this problem of um, investing and yes. where it comes from and where it doesn't go. Yes, well, one of the problems with um, investing is the vetting of course, and finding out all the underlying ties, et cetera. Um, if you're not really speaking today's language of technology, it is very hard to vet what technology you're going to invest in. And without consulting the community, you can't really build the technology they need. So right now, we're, we've ended up with a bunch of corporations that are tightly tied with in corrupt governments doing their bidding and feeding the information directly to the government. So without disengaging from that, there really is nowhere for us to go. So if with... you're making software differently, yes. how do you do it? We use free software that allows the people that use it to modify it, change it, sell it, do anything they want with it. When you're using a corporation's software, like a Facebook or whatever they build their platforms with, you cannot see into that and you cannot see what they're doing, which is, as Shoshana Zuboff is talking about now, surveillance capitalism, which in a nugget leads right down to predictive analysis. And now there is a bill that William Barr has put up to use predictive analysis to take our, pers our social media, our doctor's records, combine them and search for signs of mental illness. And then to As put us- defined by somebody. Yes, who we don't know who yet. And then to place us in observation against our will. How is this possible? <laughs> and hardly anyone knows about it. But these are platforms that are corrupt that are all filtering info to the governments. I and highly recommend Shoshana Zubrov's Surveillance yes. Capitalism, if, if you haven't read it, people. Yes. Um, Ella, to you, you don't only work with artists, but you have worked for a long time in the artistic community in Berlin. How does that fit into this discussion? How does art and how do artists engage with the same question? Well, I, I've seen uh, quite a lot of my artistic friends moving uh, away from contemporary art and rather uh, diving into the world of activism trying to apply artistic strategies to helping bring about social change. So I think that's something that is happening because also, I mean, the artistic world is subject to a colonization of people who have the money and the power to acquire arts. But uh, that also brought about a really interesting uh, movement of people applying all sorts of strategies. You work at the very 
prosaic level, though, of people's daily needs as well. And I understand you've been working on a project having to do with food delivery systems. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of automated food delivery now coming from companies like Amazon, or explicitly Amazon in the U.S. Is that a similar problem in Berlin? Yeah, it's, I, I think it's uh, starting to be a, a real problem everywhere. So a lot of these food delivery networks are owned by BlackRock, like the world's largest mm -hmm. investment company, right? So uh, no matter what are, you, what are you trying to build locally, in a sense, you need to compete against this company. But uh, what I think is super interesting, when uh, Deliveroo decided to pull out uh, of some European markets, there have been a bunch of riders who decided, uh, OK, so we are fed up anyways. We're going to start our own thing. So we will apply a different ethics to what we do. We will, you know, we will create a platform co-op, something that is owned by us, uh, something that allows us democratic control over what we do. So there's an interesting movement uh, emerging now in Europe. It's happening in Spain with Mensakas. It's happening in Berlin as well. And it's really interesting because um, this is not so much about taking a sole entrepreneurial decision about, OK, I'm, I'm starting a co-op or a company. But this, this has more of a shared effort because clearly, if a bunch of people is trying to build a sustainable food delivery network in a local sense, it's super, I mean, it's almost impossible to compete against the likes of, right. you know. So uh, this really requires a shared effort of municipalities, of activists, people who know how to build co-ops. It's super essential. The people who run the business, but also restaurants and potential partners to really build something that is a real alternative to the food delivery as mm -hmm. we know it. And... Uh, I find it so interesting because these meetings, they feel different. This is not the startup situation, but this is really about creating multi-stakeholder models in cities and you know, helping to bring about a real shared effort because all these organizations will only exist if you all want them to be. Otherwise, they will, it won't happen. They right? won't be able to compete with the yeah. huge multinational. Yeah. Well, that gets to my next question for you, Stacco, the Disco Manifesto is a lot about what happens online, but it's also a lot about what happens offline in communities. And I want to just elaborate a little bit on what Ella just said, that co-ops are typically other privately owned organizations. They're privately owned companies. They just happen to have a lot of private owners. Is there a possibility that you could have accumulation of wealth in cooperative hands that would still be concentrated, would still potentially be, you know, manipulated or abusive or surveilling? Um, or are you trying to change the whole kind of ethic of capitalism around accumulation? Well, I mean, despite the issue of private ownership, um, do you can see that co-ops are kind of like this fenced off area to experiment with other models because co-ops actually overturn the three technologies of capitalism. So um, private ownership of the means of production becomes collective ownership. Wage labor, there's no wage labor. You're the worker and the owner. And an exclusive orientation towards profit is tempered by their cooperative principles. Now, on the subject of um, cooperative as, uh, as opposed to capital accumulation, as Ella has said, there's multi-stakeholder models. And you have precedents in Quebec and Emilia-Romagna, where, for example, um, instead of privatizing healthcare, how about we give it to co-ops, yeah? And we will have four kinds of votes. And one of them, it will be the state or the municipality, they're putting up the funds. Another vote will go to the doctors. Another vote will go to the patients. And another vote will go to the family of the patients, okay? So this is the more decision-making side, but you can see that it's enfranchising people who are part of the economic activity beyond the co-op. Co-ops have existed for 150 years, but they haven't brought about the desired revolution mm. that you know um, they could foreshadow. And part of it is because they do not talk to each other. They don't know how to mutualize and they don't know how to mutualize economically for greater ends. You mentioned the big boys and they are boys, which is Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook and Apple. They have a market cap collectively of three trillion US dollars. But co-ops worldwide have also a market cap of three trillion dollars, but they're not talking to each other. You're, yes. you're nodding and smiling, Mickey. Yeah, um, the, the most important thing um, that I see and hear from people we talk with is 
What the co-op movement needs most is a secure communications platform that is not owned by the man or by governments, because without that, our communications are kidnapped. We are not in real communication, like the WhatsApp app that is just ubiquitous. That is a direct spy mechanism. You can say that it's all the problem of capital orthodoxy and the tendencies of the economy, but isn't it also our fault? Ella. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I find this a super interesting yeah. question, to be honest. And, but, but in a way, I think we've had a really tiny time window where we actually had a choice. I wonder, yeah. talking about today, if we still have that choice. Mm. Like coming back to what, what you just said, you know, the, you need to have the privilege to have the time to search for alternative, yep. to, yes. to opt out of these networks. Uh, but very often people are not in a position to opt out of Facebook and all these other platforms, WhatsApp, whatever. So that's the real problem. And it's not so much about us taking a choice. I, and and I, I, I see this rather as a quite dangerous way of, of framing the situation. I think this is more about um, building an alternative to what's there. Can we build one when Google has, I think, like 96% of all the search business at this point? Is it too late? I don't think it's too late. I mean, and if you look at the history of these monsters, they've probably existed for some 20 odd years and born out of public money. Um, here's the thing, even though they may seem like behemoths which are impossible to take down, take into account if the um, revolutionary drive of the 19th and 20th century was let's take over the factories, let's take over yes. these massive economies of scale. Um, what about if the means of production are actually in your laptop right now? And what about if we can network those laptops? It is much easier to create the alternatives. With that being said, what is really difficult is to have this network effect, because what we need are alternatives which are easy to use, which are inclusive, where your friends are. And this is where we're lagging behind, because of course we don't have those massive investments. But the actual technology, and to educate people into technology, is much simpler. It's and there. Fact, yeah, and it's yeah. beautiful for people to actually know how to make the technology, not just have it handed to you. How do we move forward <laughs> to make the kind of change that you're talking about? It's not gonna be sporadic, you over here and you over here and maybe one TV show and a million once every 10 years. How do we do it? Do we embed these discussions in schooling, in education? Do we fight for a better public media system? <clears throat> um, <laughs> what? Well, it's difficult because the education system now, um, Microsoft and Apple got in there very early in um, the the days of uh, early computing and they armed all the schools with apples and uh, Macintosh systems. So now people have grown up with these systems and feel a loyalty to them that is beyond the convenience. So for new adopters, it's the convenience. For the older um, generations that have grown up with these tools, it's nearly impossible to get them out of their hands. Those are the screens that brought them up, basically. Yes, so even when you're pointing out the inequities and how this tool you're using is your jailer, people don't really get it. Or they have to divide their mind and say, I need this tool to do my work. I can't work without it, therefore I must use it. But I caution us all to, while you're using it, think of how inequitable it is. Think of the things that it's doing to the system. But that feels like me feeling and guilty when I drink out of a, paper, of a plastic water bottle. It starts like that, but then with these movements and platforms, there are actual places to join and make change. Ella. And to not be alone. You have one of those places. I guess we find ourselves in a, you know, in a, in a place where we are constantly competing with others. Uh, about likes and about visibility, attention, and so forth. So what if we, if we would really work on strengthening our local communities, our municipalities, in order to create a sense of where we are, what our communities are, um, having more opportunities of actually getting together and helping each other with all these questions. Because one of the big problems of the neoliberal uh, uh, past 10, 50 years, uh, 15 I mean, was the fact that people got isolated in a way. Yes. So that, that, that really, that proved to be a side effect. So for me, a counter strategy is to radically um, create those opportunities and places where people can come together. That's the first thing. 
because that is missing. So what do you do in Berlin? Well, uh, there is supermarket, but also other spaces because uh, Berlin this is in recent years turned into a hub of people that want to make the world a better place, which, which is great. And since space is still sort of available, there are enough people who took advantage of that and got a space, rented it and uh, opening up that space for community events. So that's what we also do at Supermarkt. Mm -hmm. So in doing so, um, just being there, that helped uh, a community to emerge. And that wasn't curated by myself or anything. It was just about being there, opening the doors, running regular events. And then things happen automatically. They just emerge by people being in the same spot. And I really think that's a healthy um, way to, to try to counter the current situation. But of course, it's not just the communities. They also need um, backing from local politics and they need a solid financing structures. And, and that finance cannot just come from, you know, the classic world of finance, but also that needs a collaborative effort to raise funds from sources that are um, acceptable and sustainable. I, I really think these are big tasks mm. we need to tackle and there's no easy solution for that. But at the same time, you know, what I really see, for instance, at the Platform Corp conference here, I see a lot of people starting initiatives and I see them thriving. So there is hope. Mm -hmm. But we just need to bring these people together. As Doug was said, we need to build an ecosystem of platform co-ops. We caught up with one such group at the Platform Cooperative Conference titled Who Owns the World, held at the New School in New York in November 2019. For over 20 years, Smart Corp has provided work security for tens of thousands of freelancers in over 40 cities in nine European countries. Here's what they had to say. Notre organization, Smart, Euh, a compris qu'il y avait euh, une, un intermédiaire entre le salariat classique et les formes individuelles d'entrepreneuriat. Nous appelons ça la zone grise du monde du travail. Cette zone grise, elle est composée de travailleurs créatifs, de travailleurs freelance, de travailleurs qui travaillent beaucoup de manière discontinue. On appelle ça les nouvelles formes d'emploi, les emplois atypiques, les institutions, quelles qu'elles soient, prennent pas très très bien en compte cette catégorie de travailleurs qui ont pourtant besoin d'être d'être protégés et donc notre organisation tente de d'apporter des réponses nouvelles à ces nouveaux problèmes du travail et de l'emploi. We are pursuing a social uh, model for social transformation. We have a really political dimension to our project that strives to offer the best social protection for the most freelancer as possible. L'essentiel de l'activité de SMART euh, est d'apporter un cadre administratif, comptable, financier, qui permet à des, à des travailleurs autonomes, des travailleurs freelance, de facturer leurs prestations. En échange, SMART leur donne un contrat de travail, un contrat de travail salarié. SMART transforme le chiffre d'affaires en contrat de travail salarié et ainsi apporte le meilleur standard de protection sociale pour ces travailleurs. You can have a real living democracy, a participation of the members, even with a big structure like us, because we are now uh, about 25,000 cooperators or associates in Belgium. Uh, how we do that? Uh, we uh, invented or created different possibility for a member to participate into the evolution, the decision making of our cooperative. Uh, you could do it by participating to uh, small meetings uh, at night. You can do it by uh, giving your opinions uh, online on a blog, by uh, writing uh, something that you might find interesting, uh, by coming to the General Assembly each year. You can watch it online, you can vote online, you can express your voice. Sharing successful models and innovative ideas is essential if we're ever going to create a more democratic digital world. Cooperatives owned and controlled by their workers look set to play an important part in that evolution. So we often end this program by asking people what they think the story will be that the future tells of this moment. So Stacco, I'm gonna ask you, what do you, what do you think is the story the future will tell of, of us now? Just offhand, it may be the moment where people were doing things that were criticized as folly or useless, but really what we're doing is to build capacity. 
and we're building capacity because there's people that talk of collapse and you always imagine like the Mad Max, like sexy collapse, but we're in an ongoing process of collapse. But we're doing these things that may not make sense according to the predominant economic logic. But man, they will make sense in the next economic crisis, where incidentally co-ops over all economic crises have um, actually thrived and kept to their principles and been more successful. But it's not just that, it's also overcoming the, the alienation that Ella talks about. How about if the future of work does not get answered straight away with automation, but with care work, with the creation of commons, with putting our productive energies, that being the definition of work, towards social and environmental ends. And I think that we're in this hinge moment where everything may seem hopeless, but a lot of things are crumbling. And those solutions which are being posited, your green growth, your you know, um, neoliberal strategies now to tackle climate, they're not going to work. And again, process of collapse, we raise the ground with, with alternatives. All right, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all. Mickey, Stacco, Ella, great conversation. You can find out more about the Platform Cooperativist Conference or the Conference on Platform Cooperativism at our website. And we've been happy to be part of it these last few years. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.